Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning on the first day of spring, as I understand. Um, there's some, we had some nice weather this week. Hopefully it'll continue. Um, looking forward to some spending some time outside on the back porch. Well, let's stand together and let's worship our King. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that they are never enough. And you came along and you put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend, because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. You're the There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn graves in 
to guard it. You turn stones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Amen. If I don't know anything, there's one thing I know. God's the only one that can do anything. He's the only one who can do it. And, uh, you know, right now with the opening the church, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. Uh, I know a lot of people's away right now. Some people's on vacation. That's all right. Um, we are gearing up and getting ready for our second grand opening. Um, it's, it's just something that I was really focused on that once we opened we would gear up going into the Easter season. I know Easter is a, a big time when people are starting looking for a church. And uh, if we can really focus on who we can connect with, who we can talk to, and who we can pray for between now and then, um, we'll see God doing some great things. It's going to be up to us and what we do. So I just want to let you know that there's four weeks coming in to Easter. We're getting close to it. On the screen, you will see the QR code. And if you're watching online, you can go to www.newlifecincy.com. Connect with us. The reason why I want that connection is so we can plug into people. And so I can contact you. There were some people that had came before, and I didn't have a chance to contact them and meet with them. So if you would like to meet with my wife and I, or just to talk, just to connect, and how would you like to be involved, and those kind of things, just plug in and uh, give us your name and number, and we'll contact you. And also, there's a place on there for prayer. We are developing a good-sized prayer list. We want to pray for people because, let's face it, a lot of us need help. A lot of what we're going through in society, we just need prayer. So there's a place on there for prayer. But coming up, we are going to have an Easter egg hunt on April the 9th at 2 p.m. Right now, we have 1,500 eggs to put on our facility. If we see more kids come, we'll buy another 1,500 eggs. We want to make sure that every kid gets a, a good amount of eggs just to make it fun. Uh, my wife and I have been putting this together. It's, it's going to be a nice event where you're going to come in. The way it's going to look is you're going to come in, and we're going to have a coloring, a picture to color, just so the kids can interact, just a time of fellowship, maybe sharing a cookie or something, and then really talk about what is Easter for kids that represents what Easter egg's all about, what are we doing. We want to bring God into it fourfold. And then we want to have some drawings. We're going to have small door prizes. We're going to have one huge Easter basket. I say that, but we haven't bought it yet. So we are going to have something to give away. I don't want to say we've got this huge Easter basket and we can't find one, but we will have something to give away that when people get here and they register, we'll have something to give to you. And uh, we just want to make it fun. This is all part of our second grand opening. We're going to announce it to the community, community Easter egg hunt. Um, we just want it to be fun. We want to involve the kids. We want the kids to be involved. We want to bring families back together. And we want to start doing family things. So you got grandkids, you got kids, you, you have nieces, nephews, cousins. Contact them. It, it's time to get them all back in church. The following week is... I'm sorry, the following Sunday after our Easter egg hunt is Palm Sunday. See, I, I, I planned this to have the Easter egg hunt, Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday, and then we kick it off right because the Sunday after Easter is Baptism Sunday. We, we want to welcome all those who came in during that time and those who have not been baptized and have a Baptism Sunday. I already have one baptism uh, signed up. I have one baby dedication signed up. So if, if there's baby dedications, if there's baptism, 
get in. I need to know because I want to plan a baptism uh, service to talk about what is baptism to keep everybody informed as to what they're doing so they can know. So if there's anybody you know that needs to be baptized, that wants to be baptized, now's your time. And I'm hoping that through that we can really solidify their relationship with Christ through the baptism. So that's Baptism Sunday is the week after Easter. So I'm really gearing up and I'm really excited about that to see how that goes. Now's the time when we present our tithes and our offering. Our clicker's not working. What'd you do to my clicker, Eric? Okay. It goes backwards, it won't go forward. That's okay. Anyways, we, this is the time we collect our tithes and our offering. We have an offering box in the back. I am not one to ask for money. So you're not going to hear me always asking for money. But I do give the opportunity for people to give. I know when I give, when I have that opportunity to give, God takes care of myself. He takes care of my family. See, giving is based on your relationship with Christ. Giving is to say, God, you've given me this, and I trust you to take care of me, so I'm going to give you a portion. That's how much I trust you. That's what giving's all about. It's trusting God, giving him a portion. I don't tell you how much to give. God purposes it on your heart. You give what he puts on your heart. So we do have that time of giving. Now, I do let you know this, that whatever the church brings in, it's used for ministry. It's used for the community. It's the kind of things that we use to put together the, the Easter egg hunt. It's the kind of things that we do for the, the sunrise breakfast that I forgot to mention. We are having an Easter breakfast. The Easter breakfast will be around 8 o'clock. That way everybody can come, have fellowship, hang out for a little bit. And then once we all clean up and come upstairs, it'll be time for service. It's not going to be the traditional early, early morning service, but it's going to be 8 o'clock um, Easter breakfast. So we do invite you for that. But that's what the offering and tithes of the church goes to. We want to get more plugged into the community. We want to connect with people. We want to bless the people. We want to be a church that gives. We don't want to be a church just to bring it all in. We want to be a church that gives. That way when people come in, they know that we're here to bless them and we're here to help them and encourage them. If you prefer online giving, you can go to www.newlifecincy.com and there's a place on there that you can donate. So this is just a time that we pray for our offering, our tithes. It's also a time to pray for our, we have a prayer list going around. I haven't gotten it out yet, but I'm working on it. There's a lot of people that's hurting. A lot of people struggling this time of year. A lot of people that's going through a lot of things. I've talked to a lot of people. There's a lot of deaths, a lot of passings going on in their families, a lot of sickness, a lot of cancer that people are having. Um, we just want to lift everybody up to God this morning. So let us pray. Father God, we come before you. Lord, we take everyone that's been placed upon our hearts, and we just lift them up to you for prayer. Lord, I pray that not only did you bless, that will you bless them spiritually, but bless them physically, emotionally. Lord, I lift up all those who's caring for them. I lift up the caregivers and the family members. Lord, it's always hard to go through some hardships. But Lord, we just put them in your hands and ask a special blessing this morning. Lord, we lift up our tithes and our offering. Lord, we just pray for all those who give. Lord, we even pray for those who want to give but cannot give. Lord, we just pray that that money would be used to, to further your kingdom, that it would be used to witness to those around us. And we just ask all these things to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and continue singing together. And I've heard the propaganda I've heard the lies they whispered to my soul That I have been forsaken And I'll always be forgotten No matter what I do, it's not enough But then I heard a voice as it opened up the heavens 
reminding me of who I've always been. Because I am your beloved. You have bought me with your blood. And on your hand you've written out my name. And I am your beloved. The one the Father loves And mercy has defeated all my shame Cause there's no accusation Nor any condemnation When I look into my Father's eyes They don't see my sin, they only see redemption. This is how my heart has been defined. And I can hear a voice that is louder than the thunder, reminding me of who I've always been. I am your beloved You have bought me with your blood And on your hand you've written out my name And I am your beloved The one the Father loves And mercy has defeated all my shame The one who knows me best Is the one who loves me most There is nothing I have done That could change the Father's love The one who knows me best Is the one who loves me most There is nothing I have done That could change the Father's love You have bought me with your blood And on your hand you've written out my name And I am your beloved The one the Father loves Mercy has defeated all my shame And I am your beloved You have bought me with your blood And on your hand you've written out my name And I am your beloved The one the Father loves And mercy has defeated all my shame continue seeing and celebrate that the fact that you know he's the one that loves us and because of that really our story just only gets better in our walk with him ten scales from my eyes I want to see you 
I want to see you more. Tear the veil from my heart. I want to know you. I want to know you more. Tear the scales from my eyes. I want to see you. I want to see you more. Tear the veil from my heart. I want to know you. I want to know you more. I want to know you. I want to know you more. If your love is a river overflowing, then I want it, I want it all. If you died for my freedom and my redemption, then I want it, I want it all. to my steps I want to trust you I want to trust you more be the fire in my soul I'm going all in my every yes is yours I'm going all in my every yes is yours if your love is a river overflowing, then I want it, I want it all. If you die for my freedom and my redemption, then I want it, I want it all. If your love is a river overflowing, treasure my heart is after the more I seek you the more you show me cause you are the treasure my heart is after the more I seek you the more you show me cause it only gets better it only gets better It only gets better. 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 It only And my redemption. 
your beloved, that you've written our name on your hand, that, that your love was so great for us that you died for us. And that in that, when we receive you and live in, what, how you, in the ways that you've called us to, that our relationship with you just only gets better and better. We'll be with Pastor Anthony as he comes to uh, open the word and just open our hearts to the message that you have for us through him. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I remember when Eric first did that song, that song's been just resonating in my head. It only gets better. It gets better. Well, at this time, the children may be dismissed for Children's Church. I know they have something planned about exercising for the Lord, so maybe they'll come up wore out this morning. And while they're exercising down there with that, we're going to exercise our spiritual minds this morning. Amen? You know, we, we sing that song, <clears throat> It Only Gets Better. It Only Gets Better. But sometimes where we are, it's not better, is it? Sometimes where we are in life kind of stinks. Sometimes life, a lot of uncertainties. What's next? What's going to develop? Sometimes things aren't turning out the way they look to be turning out. It's almost like we're going backwards instead of going forwards. That's life. And the title of this is The Constant Trouble and Uncertainties. Have you ever had one of those moments where it's like every time you turn around, you're faced with troubles? It's like it, as soon as this works out, there's something else that falls upon you. As soon as you get this together, this falls apart. I, I don't like that. It's like you get your life together here and this part of it falls apart. And you like, oh, I'll get that together and you get that together and it falls apart. How do we process that? A lot of hurt pain, a lot of people going through sicknesses, a lot of people have cancer, a lot of people going through death and dying trauma, the civil unrest in all the countries. It's like you, you turn the news on and, and somebody's getting shot, somebody's being robbed, somebody's dying, there's bombs going off. It's just like, what is going on? How do we process this? How can we say it gets better when where we are, it's not very good? I don't know about you, but sometimes I say, Lord, what did I do? What, what did, I, did I bring this on myself? Is what I'm going through. But you know what? We cannot avoid struggles, although we try. But we can respond to them in such a way that brings us victory and peace. And I know through God's word, that's what it does. See... The passage we're going to go through this morning, I use it quite a bit because sometimes things don't always go the way I planned it. It's kind of funny. My wife and I, sometimes we make a plan. Okay, this is how it's going to work and this is how it's going to go together. It doesn't never work that way. It never works that way. And it's like, oh, man, we got to reload. We got to reboot. And we plan it this way and it never goes that way. And it's like, what in the world is going on? But I always have to come back to 2 Corinthians 4 through 9. It speaks to me. Because this morning, we're going to identify our struggles. That's the first thing we have to do. We have to identify our struggles, our thoughts, and then we want to build a biblical instruction of how to defeat the thoughts that we have. You see, sometimes we have to own our own feelings. So as I was putting this sermon together, I had all these different scenarios, and I had all these things to read, and I was like, wait a minute, that's a whole nother sermon. I had two sermons going on in my head at once. So I said, well, let me, I cut that whole piece out, and I said, that's for another day. But yet, we have to understand, we have to own our own thoughts. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of owning my own thoughts. Here's why. I've been around people that they just say all the positive things, and they think if they say enough positive things, it's going to happen. Sometimes I like to say, you know what, where I'm at right now stinks. What I'm going through right now, it hurts. There's nothing wrong with being honest and say, this hurts. I'll get over it. 
I'll get through it. God will help me. But where I'm at, I have to own my thoughts. You know, sometimes I say, God, this hurts. And he sometimes says, why does it hurt? Sometimes I say, because well, it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. And he said, there you go. So we have to open up our Bibles, and we have to get a biblical instruction of where we are and where we're going. So I'm going to start in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not of ourselves. I love this. So it says, now that we have this, this shining light in our hearts, when we accept Christ Jesus, when we decide that we want to walk with God, when we decide we want him in our lives, we have this shining light in our hearts. But we ourselves are fragile. We're one insult away from falling apart. We're one devastation away from cracking and breaking. We are fragile clay jars. But yet this fragile clay jars contains this great power within. And I like the last part of that scripture. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not of ourselves. I've always told my wife, that's why our plans fail, because he wants us to trust more on him. You see, I can come up with a plan. And the plans I usually come up with is based on what I can do and the powers that I have. And God says, watch that fall apart because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. He's saying that your plan sound great, but you're trying to do it on your own power. But I got a power that's deeper inside that I want to work through you. So what I start learning was, is when my plans fail, don't panic. Don't be upset. We opened the church. We opened up, we had 50. Today we're lucky to have 20. That's okay. I'm not going to panic because I know God's behind it. I know God's behind it. So watch this. This this is a passage I love, and I apply it to my life. 2 Corinthians, starting in chapter 4, verse 8. See, I want to try to read it without stopping because sometimes I read it. I have to stop. There's just so much in it. But we're going to read it, and then we're going to go through it. So it says, we are pressed on every side by troubles. Amen. We're pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. So I look at this, and I said I have to deconstruct it and break it down and look at it in order to reconstruct my life. And I like doing that. I like taking what it says and applying it to my life to see how I can get the victory, how I can get the peace that God has prepared for me. So in verse 8, the very first thing it says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed. We're pressed on every side. You're going to go through periods. You're going to go through times. It just seems like the walls are closing in. Don't panic. Praise God. Don't panic. Get on the prayer chain and say, hey, pray for me. You see, this is what it's all about. This is what a community is all about. It's to come in and say, you know what? We are going to be pressed. And if you haven't been pressed this week, you're going to be pressed. If you made it through so far this Sunday, not being pressed, guess what? You got this afternoon and this evening to get pressed. You're going to be pressed by trials, by troubles, and by thoughts. But you're not going to be crushed. So the next time something happens in your life and you feel like everything's closing in, you have to say, you know what? This is it's not going to crush me. This is part of life. This is part of life. So I like what Matthew 6.34 tells us. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. <clears throat> Here's why I read that. Sometimes we go through troubles today, and and I say that by my own testimony. I go through troubles today, and I think, well, if I can get this right, and I can get the right things in place, then tomorrow will be better. But the scripture says, you know what? Tomorrow brings its own worries. It brings its own struggles. I have to remind myself that even tomorrow is going to have built-in trials, built-in struggles, built-in temptations. It doesn't mean that I'm doing something wrong. 
But yet, sometimes, have you ever blamed yourself when things just fall apart? And you're like, oh, what did I do? What did I do? And sometimes God's saying, don't worry, you're not going to be crushed. He's going to get behind you. He's going to support you. He's going to walk with you. And he's going to help you. I put here sometimes when trials and troubles creep in, the panic starts. And we start saying, well, what if? What if? You ever ask yourself, well, what if I would have done it this way? Well, you could have, but guess what? Tomorrow has its own trials and its own troubles anyway, so it's going to happen anyways. See, I have to concede to the fact that there's always going to be troubles in my life. I already know it. The enemy tries to attack in three ways. This is for a whole other sermon, but I'm going to give you just a little taste bud of it. He attacks in three ways. Your health, your finances, and your relationships. If you look at areas in your life, your health is sometimes compromised. It's a struggle. Your finances, sometimes there's a struggle. And sometimes your relationship. Why do I say that? Without going off track, I don't want to go into another sermon. The reason why I say that, the devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to kill you physically. He wants to steal from you financially. And he wants to destroy you. Socially. So there's always going to be those struggles in your life. My wife and I, we talk about this all the time because we're like, okay, well, all's going good. And guess what? I'm bound to have a surgery somewhere along the line. I'm bound to have something that's going to come up. So that way when it comes up, I'm not shocked. I'm not surprised. I don't like it, but I know it's part of life. Or when all things are going well and you're like, "Uh uh-oh, something's going to happen. Our money's going to be gone. We're going to struggle. Or even in your social life. You're going to have those moments when you're at each other's throat. And it's like all your friendships and all those around you is falling apart. We are going to have troubles. We're going to have trials all the time. But guess what? We're ambassadors. Remember a couple Sundays ago I talked about we're ambassadors for Christ? We are to speak for him. We are to build the church up for him. Basically, we're like... Ministers for Christ. Now, we're not all uh, ministers to, to preach, but we're all ministers to others. Whether you have kids in your home, your coworkers, people you work with, you're ministering to somebody. So watch this. I love this verse. When you look at 2 Corinthians 6, 4, in everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. And I like this part right here. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of all kinds. I have to read that quite a bit because I don't want to patiently endure the troubles that I'm going to endure. I'm sometimes praying, God, take this away instead of saying, God, help me to endure it. Have you ever had that? You ever prayed, say, God, help me endure this? Or do you pray, say, God, get this out of my life? I'm the first to say, I'll say, God, remove this or or change this in my life. Take me this direction. But sometimes the prayer needs to be, God, help me to patiently endure this trial. I don't always have the greatest patience. It's like, I want to go through it. I want to get it done now. I want this trial to be over. I want it to be over now. I want things put back in order. I want it put back now. But the scripture tells us we have to patiently endure troubles and hardships. That's why I'm such a big advocate on relationships and unity. I want to connect with you. That's why I push that connection thing. Each week I got that QR code on there. I know you get tired of seeing it, tired of hearing it. But I have it on it for a reason. I want to build this relationship with you that when you're going through something, you can call. You can email. You can text and say, pray for me. I know we're all going to have trials and troubles. I don't want to be nosy. I don't want to be in your business. I just want to be there to lift you up, support you, and walk with you. That's all it's about. It's just having somebody else to connect with you. Someone that you can trust that you know that they're going to pray for you. So going back to 2 Corinthians 4.8. I love this. Is, this is actually my favorite part of this whole passage. <clears throat> we're oppressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. Watch this. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. I love that. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. 
Now, I'm not the greatest scholar, so I always have to go to the dictionary. What does it mean that we are perplexed? We're filled with uncertainty. How many of us have been filled with uncertainties within the last week? What's my job going to be like? What's going to go on in another country? What's my finances going to look like? Uncertainties. Is this thing that I'm starting, is it going to work out? When God said, go to Cincinnati and, and go plant a church, you're talking about some uncertainties. Oh, there was many nights I was perplexed. <laughs> but God says, don't worry. You're perplexed, but watch this. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. So when you look up the meaning of despair, it's a loss of hope. I love this because what God is speaking to me through his word, he says, you're going to be filled with uncertainties, but you always have hope. You're always going to have hope. See, in my life, I have to realize there's going to be trials. Every side, walls crashing down. I don't care if I do everything right. I don't care if I'm the role model, citizen, role model citizen. I don't care if I'm doing everything right. I got my right hallelujahs and praise the Lord's all in the right place, and I'm doing everything right. There's always going to be trials, troubles, tribulations, and there's going to be times when I have uncertainties. Well, what's tomorrow going to bring? What's tomorrow going to look like? Are we going to have 60 people next week? We're going to have 100 people then by the end of the summer. There's always uncertainties, but we always have hope. And that hope is Jesus Christ. You see, what this causes me to do, it causes me to put my focus on Jesus instead of the things in the world. You're going to try different job adventures. They're going to fall apart. You're going to try different things. They're going to fall apart. You'll engage in different relationships. They'll fall apart. And then you're going to wonder, what's next? The uncertainties. But when you keep your eyes on Jesus, there's always hope. And I like what Romans 12, 12 says. Rejoicing in hope. I like that. So you got to take that hope and you rejoice in hope. How many of us have rejoiced in hope? We have to rejoice in it knowing that there's hope. It says rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Now, if that's not a verse to put on your refrigerator, I don't know which one is. Rejoice in hope. Things are falling apart, but you got hope. It's that where the glass is half full or half empty. No, it's half full. You have to rejoice in the hope that God is going to do what he wants to do. And he says you have to be patient. How many people say they're patient people? If you're like most of us, we're impatient. I want it. I want it now. I want to see the results now. But you have to rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation. And this is the part I really like, continuing instant in prayer. So when I got to that point, I was really looking at my own prayer life. I'm, I'm looking at myself. How is your prayer life? Think about that. Is your prayer life basically a, a fly-by-night prayer when you wake up, say, praise God, thank you for getting me up? Or you're driving to work, say, oh, God, please let somebody let me out? Or God, help me make my money so I can pay my bills? I mean, are, are, is your prayer life just kind of, as you're going through life, you just say that quick prayer? I want you to develop a prayer life that you spend time with God. You get away from distractions. You get away from people. You get away from things. And you and yourself, and you just sit and you talk with God. You just talk with him. You pray. You open your word. You let him speak back to you. You see, prayer is talking to God, but you also have to let him talk to you. Because if our prayers are nothing more than just saying, God, here's what I need. God, here's what I need. God, here's what I'm going through. God, this is what I want. And then we say, yeah, I prayed today. But you have to develop that time to say, you know what, God, here, I'm pressed. And here's why I'm pressed. And here's how I'm feeling. It's like, it's like he's my big therapist. Oh, we sit down. We just have conversation. We just talk. I say, God, here's what I'm feeling. And here's, I, I love it. Because sometimes I say, God, I'm upset. And he'll say, why are you upset? And i got to look deep inside to identify, why am I upset? And I say, God, because it didn't happen the way I want it to. He says, oh, so you want it to be done your way. Oh, so you got a pride issue. And I'm like, oh, hold, time out, God. We ain't got to get too personal. No, but I, I just like talking to him because he takes me down that path. 
He takes me down that path. But we have to understand that we, we are perplexed, but we always have hope. Now, Romans 15, 13. I like this. Now, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that ye may abound in hope. How? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope is amazing. You see, hope is amazing because hope is God. So it says when you, you got to be patient in your hope. You, you have this moment of uncertainty, but you have this great hope. And he says, now the God of hope will fill you with all joy. I want us to have joy even when we're going through the worst of worst times. I want us all to understand that I might be going through something devastating, but it's not going to kill me. It's not going to crush me. It's not going to devastate me. But I got a team of people I can call and say, pray for me. And then I can rejoice because God of hope will fill me with joy and peace. Knowing that the spirit resides and lives in and through me. You see, that's where the power is at. The power is from the spirit. So there's, it, there is uncertainty. But God is the God of hope. And by his spirit, we will overcome. It took me a long time to realize it was by his spirit. Because I used to think, well, if I had this job, if I had this education, if I had these finances, if I had these people in my life, if I had this going on, things would be better. And God says, no, 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 and no. All you need is the Holy Spirit. Because when you get the Holy Spirit, he's calling the shots. He's going to give you peace. He's going to give you joy through the trials, through the tribulations that you're going to go through. Because there's going to be many. I, I recite this verse to myself all the time, knowing that... Every day is going to be a trial. There's always going to be something pressing against us. I'm not going to break. I'm going to rise up. I'm going to praise God. And I'm going to say, yeah, I got hope. Praise the Lord. We'll get through this. We will get through this. So instead of worrying, I have a feeling of excitement in the midst of adversity. You ever worry? Sometimes things happen you start to worry. I want to get past that worrying, and I want to be filled with excitement in the midst of adversity. So let's move on to finish this out. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed. There we go. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We always have hope. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. You're never going to be left alone. You know what, in my life, I've left God before. God's called me to do some things, and I wanted to do it my way, and I left him. He never abandoned me, because every time I got up and I said, you know what, God, I'm sorry, let me come back. He's always been right there. He's always been right there. And you know, we're hunted down sometimes. People always want to get at us. You ever want to try to do something, and it seems like everybody just wants to rain on your parade? Say something negative, but well, that's not going to work. It's like, man, just leave me alone. It will work. Oh, that's not going to work. I, I, I don't like that. People just so quick to say, oh, that's not going to work. I'll say in the name of Jesus, it will work. And I just look for the Spirit to guide me and to direct me because I know in his name it can work out if I do it his way. Not my way, but his way. You see, the enemy wants to use people to create that doubt in my mind. The next time somebody says, that's not going to work, take it with a grain of salt, and then you go consult your therapist. Say, hey, God, you gave me this idea. You gave me this plan. Is it going to work? He'll say, I'll see it through, but you follow me. You become obedient to me. It's going to work. So we're hunted down, but we're never, never, never abandoned. And I like the last part. We get knocked down but we're never destroyed. <clears throat> you are going to be knocked down. You're going to take hits. You're going to fall. But you're never destroyed. See, I have to understand that. I have to remind myself of that. Sometimes I, I am my worst critic. I sometimes am my own worst enemy because sometimes things do not work out. I'm thinking, what did I do? I fell. And I want to beat myself up. Well, if I would have did it this way, I might not have fell. Or if I would have did, you know, you, you can only second guess. 
And, and it's not a bad concept, because if you do find something that you did wrong, you can correct that. But the re realization is, is when you fall, you get back up. You get back up. I fell, and uh, when I fell, I quit ministry. I quit going to school. I quit it all. God said, oh, no, you don't. Everything around me fell apart. And the reason why is because God says, I want you to get back up. And when I got back up, I realized he didn't abandon me. He put me back together. And he put things back in order the way he wanted them. You just have to realize you are going to fall. Don't beat yourself up if you fall. Send out a prayer requests. Connect with us. Let's encourage each other. Let's pray for each other. And then you, you find that identity to say, okay, why did I fall? What did I do to, to maybe put myself in that position? Or what causes me not to want to get up? I mean, there's so many things to process. But you are going to fall. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. You just get back up. Praise the Lord. Matter of fact, in, in Proverbs 24, 16. For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again. Well, I might have fell once today. That means I'm going to fall six more times? Probably. <laughs> but you know what? I'll keep getting up. I'll keep getting up. And that's the one thing that we can encourage kids. Hey, be willing to fall. Get back up. And it's like, you ever find yourself as a parent encouraging your kids to get back up, but sometimes we fall, we don't want to get back up. It's like we got this double standard. And God's saying, well, if you fall, you get back up too. Because he's our father. We're his children. And just like you want to see your children get up and be better, he wants us to get up. The point of that is we're all going to fall. If you fall, don't lay there. Don't have a pity party. But you enlist a team of prayer warriors at your side. And you understand that falling is part of the process. You get back up. So I'm comforted. I'm comforted by 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. We're going to experience troubles. You're going to have them. They're going to happen. You didn't necessarily do anything wrong. Sometimes you'll be confused and perplexed. I'm always confused and perplexed. But you know what? I always have hope. And you always have hope. Sometimes the enemy wants to get at you. But God always has your back. He never leaves you. He's always there. Sometimes you'll get knocked down or fall. But you will never be destroyed. See, I remind myself of that. That's huge. I might fall, but I won't be destroyed. Things might not work out. I won't be destroyed. You get back up. And by his grace and mercy, we get to victory. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we just come before you once again today. Thank you for your word. But sometimes I need to hear that. Sometimes I need to read that. Because, Lord, sometimes I face a lot of trials, troubles. Sometimes I feel like the walls are crashing in, and I'm thinking, what in the world's going on? But then I read your word, and you're saying, that's okay, I'm still in your will. But sometimes I, I feel like the uncertainties are weighing me down. But yet, through your word, you're letting me know that through uncertainties, there's always hope. We just got to keep our eyes on you. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, that when we fall, we don't lay there. But we enlist a team of, of surrounding uh, Christians that want to support us and pray for us and help us up. Lord, I know you're there for us each and every step of the way. But the one thing I know is that all, your, all the trials that we face is for your glory. I know all the things that we go through, we can get back up and do it the way you called us to do it. Because you're strong within us. And we just praise you and, and ask that you continue to walk with us, encourage us, support us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. God, take us back. place we begin, the 
simple pursuit of nothing but you. The innocence of a heart in your hand. God, take us back. God, take us back to an unswerving faith in the power of your name. A heart beating for your kingdom to reign. A church that is known for your presence again. God, take us back. There's nothing close to you nothing could ever come close nothing and no one it's you and you only nothing could ever come close let's keep our hearts real Keep your grace close. You're bringing us back. You're bringing us home to an unswerving faith in the power of your name. A heart beating for your kingdom to reign. A church that is known for your presence again God take us back because nothing and no one comes close to you nothing could ever come close nothing and no one it's you and you only nothing could ever there to welcome us back. Be with us all as we go our separate ways and just help us to remember as we go through whatever struggles this week holds that you're the hope that we have and that you're always there. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.